seven years uh, as a complete uh, wipe of your, uh, your arrearage. We change that from seven to be five years. Um, and we've also noted a couple of things. First of all, in paragraph nine here, we say notwithstanding the, uh, the now five year requirement, uh, any assistance received for rearage retirement in calendar 20 or 21, essentially those who are affected by COVID may not be counted toward the limitation on the number of times they can receive assistance. So basically this is the get out of debt free card for the bill uh, arrearage retirement for these two calendar years, last year and this year. Mm -hmm. What you also have under eight, we have heard that of the of those who are denied assistance under EUSP, a significant proportion of those are actually uh, being turned down because of paperwork requirements. And what we're doing here is we're giving them, uh, we're requiring DHS to provide notice of that deficiency in the paperwork and then afford the applicant an opportunity of not less than six, three months to cure it, during which time the electric company I should say electric or gas company, it should say utility company, may not begin the process to terminate service. Actually, no, here it is electric company because it is only electric. Okay, I see Delegate Howard has his hand raised. Mr. Chairman, how would you care to address this? Uh, you can go ahead and recognize him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's the standard for, if we're waiving this COVID, people that have ne negatively been affected by COVID, what, what standard is that? Is it like they lost their job? Or is this just I mean, walk no, this, here? Here in EUSP, this is uh, a um, an income qualification, right. either below 175 percent of poverty, which is the current, or or 200 mm -hmm. percent or below. This is not the package of money that came out of the Relief Act. This is more long term changes to the EUSP, the Electric Universal Service Program. Right. Uh, so what Delegate Davis was interested in was working hand in hand with the Relief Act, which is short-term uh, relief for COVID particular. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a more long-term um, structural change to the EUSP statute. Uh, and then the utility limited income mechanisms are also a long-term solution for, um, letting, for helping people to uh, maintain their electric and gas service. Okay. But they, they no, there's, no, there's nothing there's nothing in particular here that says it's only for COVID. What we're saying here in the uh, in the paragraph nine is if you are otherwise qualified to get this assistance, meaning 175 or 200 percent of poverty, right. any arrearage retirement you get in calendar 20 or 21 doesn't count towards the every five years with the amendment. Uh, ability to have your arrear just retired with public assistance. When when does that sunset? That doesn't sunset. It's only these two years. Mm -hmm. In other words, an arrearage in in calendar twenty two wouldn't would count towards that once every five years. But if it's in twenty or twenty one, it would not. Why did, why did we back down um, from seven to five? Uh, frankly, it's, uh, you know, seven, seven was tied to, but it was picked out of the air actually as a, uh, tying to bankruptcy. Uh, this was felt that, okay. uh, gi given the structural change in the programs and, and this is, this has been a long-term issue. Uh, I mean, this program started based on legislation in 1999, um, with the restructuring. This is the first time there was a uh, an electric universal service program that was being administered through the state. Uh, and at that point, it was once in a lifetime. Over time, there were such continuing problems with arrearages and the difficulty of DHS or its predecessor DHR to juggle benefits so that you could actually get electricity turned back on, uh, that it was changed to be seven years. And that program, that, that problem hasn't gone away. Um, okay. So we figured this would be slightly more generous, but still, again, aside from 20 and 21, uh, it's going to be a, with a significant um, delay between uh, uh, potential arrearage retirements. There's still some 
personal responsibility within those five years. And Mr. Chairman, if you want to add anything to that, that's um, between bites. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you said it exactly right. Um, the seven years, although, uh, well, I don't really remember. I, so I'm going with Bob on, on the um, on, on the bankruptcy stuff. It was arbitrary. We, when I was discussing with them, we wanted to make it so, there were a number of things that it, it, I can explain why as they come up, it, it, your questions on what we just went through. But there are just a number of things that needed modernizing, quite frankly, to meet today's need. There's no need of having the um, fund and, and the other aspects of the things that we're doing if they're not meeting um, the, the needs of the folks. One of the changes I believe we've made in there deals with um, documentation. If, uh, if folks didn't have everything in, they were just sort of automatically, or at least my understanding, they were... Um, you know, they were denied. So we put some some safeguards in place that they'll still have to turn in all the required paperwork, but they're not getting denied, you know, all of what I perceive to be uh, a minor things or, you know, and some of the stuff is just complicated for, um, you know, for some of our constituents. So these are things, um, you know, we've tried to work with, with the Public Service Commission, um, initially with the utilities to um, just see what we could do to help move the ball along. So that's, that's the genesis of where it came from. Okay, is that uh, does that work for you, Dele? Is that a sufficient answer, Delegate Howard? Yeah. Okay. Close enough. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, to continue yeah. through, if there are no other questions, to continue yeah, through I, this. If, yes, uh, Council. The, the, uh, Delegate Chakurian has a question. The chair recognizes the Delegate Chakurian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually was. I have. A question related to EUSP, but do you prefer I can wait till the end if, if it's preferable to just sort of ask all the questions at the end, or did you want us to ask as we were going along? And I'm sorry if I missed it since I left for three minutes. What's if, your preference? Well, if they didn't, yeah, if it's related, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mr. Yeah. If it's related to to what he's talking about, go go right ahead. Thank you. Yeah, it's related to EUSP and it's also related to documentation. So um, I guess the first question is I was trying to see if the way this is written, it expands the amount of money coming into EUSP or are we sort of dealing with roughly the same surcharge? But that's money? later. That's later. Okay. So then the second question that's related to that is uh, Bill Freeman and I have actually spent a lot of time this year trying to get help to people who pay their utilities through their rent or through condo fees, and especially in some of the low income condo areas where the that there's the possibility of a sort of master metered shutoff for everybody because the condo association can't get enough, even though individuals would be eligible. They're eligible for LIHEAP, they're not eligible for EUSP. And I didn't know if in this process it's worth um, thinking, especially if we're expanding the amount of money that's there, um, thinking about addressing um, that eligibility as well. Is that something that either of the chairs might be open to? Um, I'm not quite sure if I got the question, but, but if I got it, if I, if I have interpreted it correctly, we're basically talking about folks who are on master meters. I get, and, and for those who, who may have more information on this than me, please correct me or jump in. But as I see it, the, the issue with the master meters is in that that's more so the owner of the property, the, um, like the house, the, the, the apartment complex or whatever. So the concern would be for me is that these people, the renters are actually paying and in, in, through their rent, they're actually paying their, um, they're paying their, their, e electri their electricity, their energy and so forth. And the, the property owner is making a business decision for lack of a better way to put it, to just not pay it. But the people that we're trying to help, if they've paid their rent, then they've paid their utility bill. So the, the, the problem becomes, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we do that? Um, because we would be subsidizing them, but effectively they've already paid what they owed. It was, is the, is the property owner that for whatever reason, isn't paying the full amount. I, so, this makes perfect sense in my head. I, I don't know if I'm it, it correctly it, at all. Can I give it a shot, Mr. Chair? Please. 
Okay, so I think there's there's sort of two parallel issues. One is if I pay $750 a month in rent and $100 of that is going towards utilities, the question is if other people who pay their utility bills are eligible for assistance, why wouldn't I be eligible for that portion of my rent, right? And the way LIHEAP works, the way LIHEAP and MEEP works right now in the state, I am. So if I'm paying my rent, I can apply, my landlord signs an agreement, and, it, and, the, and then the money goes towards my rent credit, right? So now I only pay $650 and LIHEAP writes the check to the landlord who's writing the check to Pepco or whatever, right? So my question is, so that works for LIHEAP right now, EUSP, the way it's been written in statute, this is where Bill and I had a number of conversations. I think it's in the regs, but it may be a statute issue. But that, that question of should I also, because those same ratepayers are paying they are paying into this, right? So those same ratepayers through their rent, if they're paying $100 a month to, of their rent towards electricity. Um, so so that, that's one piece of the issue. And I've heard from renters and condo folks about this. The second piece of the issue, and this I think in your district, Mr. Chair, in my district where we have, in Prince George's and Montgomery in particular, where we have condos that are low income housing, where we actually have condo associations that have so many people that can't afford to pay their condo fees, that they're at risk of, it's not like a business decision for some major, you know, a big property owner that has access to unlimited capital, but there's a condo where the owners, I'm sorry, the condo association um, is struggling to be able to pay that master metered bill because so many people in the condo association can't pay and are, uh, can't pay their their uh, their condo fees at that point in time. So again, the way MEEP works is it gets credited toward it can be credited towards their condo fee. It's a com it's a convoluted piece of paperwork, but that can be done. Um, and so my question is just if if our goal is to help low income people and low income people may pay their electricity any number of ways, some directly, some through condos, some through rent, then there's an equity thing, I think, in making sure that we're helping all, everyone who's paying their electric bills and is struggling, even if it's part of their rent, they're probably struggling to pay their rent and that's a piece of it that could be credited. So I'm not sure if that makes more sense, but that's I think that's the issue. Okay. Um. Uh, let me just note that we have on the line, we could eventually speak with um, uh, Bill Freeman is on the line, or he was, and also we have Tanya Zimmerman, who's the budget analyst. Uh, you might want to take this up later as we get through the rest of the bill and we deal with uh, money for the next couple of years. Sure thing. Fair enough. I have a separate question too, but sorry, Mr. Chair, did you want to respond to what I... I, if you're talking to me, um, well, it's your bill. I don't know, or other Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say let let's take it up later. Let let's okay. try to get through this, and and then we'll we'll did do a deeper dive on um, specific um, inquiries. Okay, my my second question, and again, we can put it off, but I just want to post it now, is. Um, uh, also an equity question of people who pay into the system and don't benefit from the system. Right now, it's my understanding that the LIHEAP MEEP process requires social security numbers, uh, social security cards that's uh, tied to federal requirements. I think EUSP, because it's our own system, we can set it up. Either it aligns with that or it doesn't. It's my understanding right now is most people access EUSP when they access LIHEAP. Um, but I'm just wondering if it's if we can also just make sure that we're building all of this additional assistance out in a way that's not necessarily tied to LIHEAP because it would be a shame for us to build all of this out and then have the same people excluded from this aid as are currently, I believe, excluded from the LIHEAP aid. So we can deal with it later, but I just wanted to post that while we're discussing this piece of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairs. All righty. Okay, <clears throat> so if there are no further questions on this portion of the bill, we'll move on down. This is the USP statute again. Um, most of this is all existing law. Uh, it's all existing law actually. And we then get to a new provision <clears throat> here dealing with the uh, Department of Human Services this is the statute that actually has the Maryland Energy Assistance Program, which is, as you all know, is a state program, but it's entirely federally funded, um, which is why the federal requirements pass through. 
Uh, these are definitions. And then we, under the actual provision that deals with the energy assistance program, we add a new short-term provision. This is a, uh, this is setting up a short-term special fund within DHS OHEP, um, $10 million each year from REGI directly for fiscal years 21 and 22 uh, in a special fund to provide for bill assistance and arrearage rearage retirement for residential and natural gas customers under both EUSP and MEEP in order to address the greatest need for restoring and continuing these utility services in the discretion of the office. So this is something where we're not saying it's 5 million to MEEP and 5 million to EUSP. It's 10 million as Bill Freeman and his people see fit for fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. Only those two fiscal years, um, two year transfers. Following that there's uncodified language that actually accomplishes the revenue transfer and then also authorizes the Department of Human Services to process the special fund budget amendment during this fiscal year, which they would need um, to in order to take care of fiscal 21. And those funds will not revert to the general fund. They will remain available until fully expended for both fiscal years. The next portion of the bill, also something the DHS needs to know about the chairman wants to set up a work group on low income utility assistance to examine the federal, state, local, and private assistance available to low income residential electric and national, natural gas customers consisting of the secretary of human uh, services or his designee. Uh, and that will be the chair of the work group as well as the DHCD secretary, the AG or the AG secretary designee, public service commission's chair or designee People's Council or People's Council designee, one senator, one delegate, two members representing the interests of low-income residential electric and natural gas customers, and two members re representing natural gas and electric utilities. DHS has to staff the work group. Of course, they're also getting $10 million for two years. They may be able to find the money for it. The work group has to study the different forms and systems of assistance for those customers from the feds, from the state, from localities and private sources, especially MEEP and EUSP. It has to study the inefficiencies and gaps in availability, qualification and processing of applications for financial assistance. It has to study coordination of benefits under all of those programs and means to improve coordination. It has to study the anticipated short-term and long-term demand for these assistance, not in the wake of COVID and systemic economic inequities, particularly in disadvantaged communities. So that's the longer term uh, issues that are constantly being brought up uh, for good reason. And then the feasibility of establishing one or more financial assistance programs for small businesses in low income communities. And then any other matter the work group considers relevant or helpful to addressing the needs of low income utility customers. There is currently no system uh, for uh, low income uh, for small businesses in low-income communities, something else that might be considered. There is no explicit gas universal service program. We only have one for electric. The only gas assistance is under MEEP, which is electricity, gas, kerosene, coal, wood, whatever you have to burn, they'll provide assistance for. Uh, work group has to study and report on or before next January 1st to uh, finance and economic matters. Uh, and then this next section, the section five, says that the special fund provision for uh, DHS uh, for the $10 million a year sunsets at the end, of the end of fiscal 23. So that gives them one additional fiscal year to um, uh, spend the money and get rid of it. Finally, as it is in the, in the current bill, it's an emergency bill. So it would take uh, effect from the day of enactment, date of signing. That's, that's the bill as amended by the chairman's uh, uh, amendments. Hey, Delegate hey. Howard has a question. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Delegate Howard. Thank you, chair. Give me one second. So it looks like page three, section two, 
like to proffer an amendment. And I think this speaks to some of the, the in what you were looking at in section five of the last page, Bob. Yeah. About, uh, short term, long term interest yep. and the mm -hmm. overall public good. I'd like to strike that language, offer a verbal amendment. I can certainly get it to you in writing. It says the public interest in public good and balancing the interest of customers, shareholders, and the societal good. So I think that's a little bit more encompassing. I think that goes towards a little bit more. That's, uh, that's, here, that's, okay, Delia oh, Howard, that's oh. here in E2. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A this is three. Yeah. Uh, amendment number two. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we would strike portion of the cost of the mechanism to be borne by the utility company shareholder rate payers respectively and substitute the public interest and public good in balancing the interest of customers, shareholders, and the societal good. That speak, I think that speaks to exactly what is trying to be accomplished, especially outlined in section five on the last page of the amendments. Okay, the, these are criteria for the, uh, this is within the criteria that the PSC would use to evaluate yeah. uh, a limited income mechanism that's being run by a utility. That's correct. Look at how was that was that the suggested information coming from um from um, a BGE? Yes. Okay. All right. Tell you what, guys. For now, let let's let's take it all. We, we'll hold off on the voting and and so forth um, for another day. But let's. I I, I was hoping, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we could get any questions, concerns, uh, amendments, such as Delegate Howard, that we can get them all out there and and then give council an opportunity to review and so forth and so on. And then we'll, we'll reconvene again, if you're so inclined, sir, to um, actually have the voting session within the subcommittee. But I didn't want it, I, I know this is a lot, and I didn't want to put everybody in the position of having to hear it for the first time and vote all at the same time. Right, uh, okay, I agree, Mr. Chair. That's, and that's why I was kind of pushing this because that's how I thought the direction that we were going. But if you want me to get that to Chair Brooks and Chair Chair Davis in writing, that's certainly and count. Yeah, that that, yeah, that, 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 that would, would be, be helpful. That would be helpful. Okay, yes, I, I wasn't trying to be no. overly, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, no, there, no, I mean, you're fine. Okay. There were uh, questions from um, Delegate Motts and then also Delegate Tricudian. Okay, the chair recognizes uh, Delegate Motts. <clears throat> Well, uh, thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, uh, Delegate Howard uh, raised the questions that I was going to raise also just for <clears throat> discussion. Um, and so that, that issue has been hashed out. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right, uh, Delegate Chakurian. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what that proposal is. And I understand we don't have it in front of us, but I do think, I don't, I think it's really important that we have utility shareholders front and center in the conversation about who's bearing the cost of these things. And I am concerned that um, we sort of repeatedly have situations where the ratepayers have to bear the brunt of the costs. Uh, we talked about it over the summer, the issue of sort of shared sacrifice. And I'm, I am concerned about, I don't know what the right place to have the conversation is. And maybe it's once we see the amendment, but I just wanna mention now in that conversation that um, I am concerned about any proposals that, um, as, you know, that, that sort of weaken the ability of the Public Service Commission to take a really serious look at who ought to bear the costs um, of the way that we make sure everybody is taken care of, especially in tough times. And so um, I just hope that, I suspect that um, utilities may have suggestions that would attempt to, to weaken this. I just hope that we can really be clear that we are protecting our ratepayers first and foremost, and certainly the shareholders deserve an ability to earn a return on their investment. But I want to make sure when we're sharing the sacrifice on um, hard times that everybody is sharing in that sacrifice. And it would be a shame if we had this opportunity in front of us um, to really make a major difference. And I want to thank the chairman for bringing this bill. Um, it would be a shame if we missed this opportunity uh, to, to kind of keep that front and center. Okay. Thank you. Right. I don't know how to raise my hand uh, on my phone. Oh. 
Go well, ahead, uh, Delegate Walker. Walker. All right, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> thank you all for your patience. It's been a hectic day for me and uh, technology as well. A um, couple quick questions, if I, if I can ask. Uh, that 200% uh, income level we're talking about over poverty, what does that mean dollar-wise? Uh, actually, uh, that would be for for a family of one, that would be twenty five thousand seven hundred sixty. Family of two, thirty four eighty three. Family of three, forty three nine twenty. Family of four, fifty thousand. Family of four, what was that? You say fifty thousand? The fifty three thousand, and, and right. five would be sixty two oh eighty. Gotcha. I, I think that's fair, uh, somewhat. Uh, ooh, that's combined though. Um, all right. Also, what about uh, people? Uh, would they qualify for this program if they're already heavily in arrears with their bills? That's the point. The arrears retirement. Okay. So that so the amount that's owed is forgiven, modified. How are we handling that? That's arrearage retirement is just that. It's a forgiveness of the of the debt. It's usually needed. It's it's usually needed in order to get the service turned back on if it's already been turned off. They can't they can't turn it back on unless it's cleared. Sure. No, and, and okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Delegate Walker. No, I will say no, forgive me for being naive. Retirement in this committee is a little bit different than what I'm used to. So I like that. So this is a forgiveness of the uh of the actual amounts that are due. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate you, Mr. Chair. Like always, though, you know, I'm always going to say, uh, and I, I'm assuming uh, and the chairman, it's his bill, and I kind of agree with Charcuti. If this is a, a one-time shot, uh, once in a lifetime, are we sure that we're doing enough at the $53,000 level for a family of four? I know 200 seems like a lot, 200%. The problem seems like a lot, but was there any talk or discussion and possibly going up to 250%? I think the problem with that, Delegate Walker, is the more you expand it, and I get what you're saying, it doesn't sound like a lot, but the pot, quite frankly, isn't a lot either, relatively speaking. And the more you increase it, the, the more, I mean, the more you expand the, the percent of federal poverty level, the more people you make eligible as well. So, you know, I, I guess it has that twofold of, uh, effect. You, I mean, you're creating, you're, you're making more people eligible, but you're having less dollars. We're not cr increasing the amount of dollars that we have, even though we've expanded the pool. Mr. Chairman, do, or, do we uh, anticipate Bob, the? Oh, sure, Bob. Just a simple thing. Uh, first of all, uh, Bill Freeman should be on the call from DHS. Uh, second of all. The bill with the amendments allows the Public Service Commission to allow the uh, utilities to be more generous, but it doesn't make that same change for the, the publicly funded or the ratepayer funded EUSP. Uh, so they can always expand things in the utility mechanisms that PEPCO could certainly file and then share between the shareholders and the ratepayers. Uh, I don't know if uh, also we had the budget analyst on uh, Tanya Zimmerman, uh, but I think Bill might be the one with the uh, the figures for the um, uh, federal. I don't want to speak for him. And then after that, Delegate Motz has a question. Yeah, and, and, and if Bill can answer within that question, how many people do we anticipate we will be affecting? Do we anticipate the the ten million will be exhausted, or you know, there's going to be you know, just because of the people that qualify, you know, we may only end up using seven. Do you have any numbers like that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bob. And, and um, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing all this language. Uh, we're still absorbing it, quite honestly. Um, I, I think likely we can move through that $10 million. I did want a point of clarification, Bob. Did I see a change to the senior eligibility under the main EUSP? Uh, yes, you did. It would allow uh, at least 67 years of age, raising the threshold to 200% of poverty for EUSB. Right, right. So that would significantly increase the um, the eligible population, certainly reduce the number of folks who are denied for being over income in that cohort. Um, so that would be helpful. But I think it's difficult to keep at this point. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces in here, but in terms of spending projections, I think it's tough to, to gauge. We'll have to absorb a good bit of this. 
Yeah, and this is remember this is this is a long term uh, structural a, a bill for long term structural change, both uh, in terms of expansion of the uh, state based EUSB, as well as the ability of the utilities to come in with their own limited income assistance programs. But this is over on top of what y'all passed and was signed yesterday as Chapter 39, the Relief Act, uh, which throws significant amounts of money through PSC towards the um, uh, utilities for arrearage retirement and bill assistance, which PSC oh, is still trying to figure out. And Council, I don't know whether a Delegate Walker was on, on, on the call, I mean, on the, on the um, when you when you had mentioned the fact that uh, this would this retirement would be for 21 and uh, 2021 and 2022 and plus it wouldn't count against account against what the five year uh, forgiveness period correct so, uh, so that makes it even even better for the uh, the person who's who's dead getting who's uh, bill is getting retired okay I see delegate Motz with a hand up as well as David Lapp the acting people's counsel okay uh, delegate Motz. Uh, thanks, Chairman. And I'm sorry to bring this up earlier. First, I want to thank Chairman Davis for bringing this bill. This is uh, uh, very timely. It's really important, and it's a, it's a it's a, it's a, a great effort. Um, and and someone was brought to my attention about um, uh, the Maryland Energy Administration. Am, am I accurate in in saying that the bill would direct 10 million from CEF? Is that is that accurate, or is that a projection? What it would do is to uh, take 10 million a year for two fiscal years from Reggie proceeds. And instead of putting them into CEF, we put them directly into uh, uh, DHS OHEP. Is there any concern about CEF? Because we know what we just passed with the Relief Act and the um, burdens that the Relief Act will create on the CEF fund. Um, I'm just wondering if I didn't hear Maryland Energy Administration discussed when we talked about the task force um, if there was a role there, if there was any discussion about um, CEF and Maryland Energy Administration, whether they should be involved in this. That's above my pay grade. But, um, <laughs> what, <clears throat> but what I would say is that we do have our budget analyst, Tanya Zimmerman, on the line uh, if she has any concerns or requests or ability to, uh, I mean, the, the CEF auction, the Reggie auctions are uh, always a, a, a crapshoot anyway, to be honest. But <laughs> Uh, in terms of what we get any given time, because it's an auction. But uh, my understanding was we should have enough funds, even with the Relief Act, going forward. If Tanya has a different question she, or different of you, she can chime in now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I would, um, with what Bob said is accurate. We, we don't know exactly how much we'll get, but um, the auctions are held uh, quarterly. There will be one in a... In a mm -hmm. The most recent auction uh, received um, over seventeen million dollars. The one before that was um, fifteen, and the one before that was thirteen. So, um, in each fiscal year, there's four auctions. There's still two to be held, so it would be within the amount of funds um, that we would receive. So, so I, I guess yeah, my so, question oh. would be: Would would Maryland Energy Administration? Um, Contribute or would it dilute because it would add another another voice to the discussion? Sometimes it helps to have an extra voice. Sometimes it kind of it can lead things astray. I'm, and that's no disparaging remark towards MEA. I just I didn't know if that's uh, a worthy conversation to have. Uh, I think the the design was to make it <clears throat> primarily with those bodies that deal with uh, human services and the need identifying the need as well as the regulator who oversees the USP Public Service Commission and to keep it a relatively small group so it didn't go off into uh, the weeds. So MEA has no control over the money. They basically get what they get based off of the auction. Correct. Yeah, yeah. if I, a, a delegate, uh, <clears throat> Maz, if I can say it, for, for fiscal 2020, um, Reggie took in 54 million, all around the 55 million. And 90% of the uh, C funds come from Reggie, yeah. Now I was looking at some prediction projection that MBA did for fiscal 2021, and they were projecting like 44 million coming from Reggie, and for fiscal 2022, it's going to be down to 22. So, right. but so we, the, but yeah. go, go ahead, go ahead. 
So, but we enact this. Is there any situation where MEA could say, sorry, guys, CEF's tapped out. We can't fund this program anymore. Uh, that's going to be above my pay grade. <laughs> Let me try. I, I, uh, it's not above mine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think what we have to remember, and Bob, correct me if I, I'm not remembering correctly, when the whole ready thing was set up and so forth, you know, bill pay, arrearages, and so forth, that was one of the primary things that the money was supposed to go to. We set up SEEF, and, and now a whole lot of other uses have been put into, you know, that we can use the rent you money for. Some of them, quite frankly, or many of them, to be perfectly honest, I think it's a bit of a reach, but, but we've used it for other things. But bill pay, arrearages, that was one of the primary things that this money was expected to go to. Correct. I agree with the chair. I just, I know there's a lot of people on, you know, there's a tree planting bill. Delegate Brooks and I were a party to that. There's a lot of people going after these Reggie and C funds. So I just, you know, to me, moving forward, we just got to be very careful and diligent on, on how we're allocating and what we're allocating these funds to, especially as Delegate Book, Brooks pointed out, not just in this meeting, but also in the meeting that we were co-assigned to, the bill hearing we were co-assigned to, those Reggie funds are um, at least projected to diminish. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have the Acting People's Council with his hand up. Uh, go on, uh, uh, David, please. I I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, Chairman, Chairman Brooks. Yeah, go, go ahead, uh, uh, David. Okay, right thank you okay. very much. Uh, th thank you very much and thank you for um, inviting us here today. And I, I wanna say um, special thanks to Chair Davis and Chair Brooks for your work on this. We think this is really Im important. You know, there's there's some really great stuff in here. And, um, you know, overall we're, we're very supportive. The, um, uh, you know, the documentation requirements, um, you know, the, the the, the, the concepts here and the, many of the details we think are very good. We're still um, studying it, um, uh, trying to understand it, um, you know, the way it would work. Um, the, one, the one point uh, I think that, that we would want, want to just highlight, um, it relates to how the, um, the, the, the decisions are delegated to the public uh, service commission and to uh, you know really to the utility fi filings and then to the public service commission as to um, determining um, at least some of the amounts that will be um, will be used in the utility programs. Um, you know generally we're often in favor of of you know giving discretion to the commission and and you know this does give a lot of discretion to to the commission. Um, we think maybe that discretion um, in this situation, there, there could be more guidance to the commission as to um, what outcome the General Assembly wants in terms of what, what sorts of ratepayer impacts are acceptable, um, what are the goals as far as um, you know, helping ratepayers, um, helping low-income ratepayers. Other, other states, for example, have um, percentage of income payment plans, you know, that, that set, for example, like a, I think Illinois, I was looking at, that has 6%, um, has, has a low income customer paying 6% of their household uh, income to, to their bill. And then the goal is that the state, um, through state programs, um, covers the, the rest or as much as the funding um, allows. And, um, the subsection E leaves a lot of discretion to the commission. Um, we don't know where that will go. I mean, we, we, we would, of course, be a party before the commission, and, and this isn't a comment about the commission's work, but to the extent that the language could include targets or maybe a cap on, you know, a minimum and a maximum um, to provide the commission um, more guidance um, 
but uh, generally speaking, I, I want to say we, we really support um, the bill. We do think that um, putting the contribution of shareholders up front, you know, is explicit in the bill is, is important as well. And of course, we'd be um, happy to uh, help uh, in terms of, you know, suggestions or um, at answering any questions that um, the committee may have. Um, and again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be here today and, and to share our, our perspective. All right, quick question, Dave. You said the yep. percent of, of, of income, what we're talking about household income or just the, the person who owns the account. Uh, and and what's, what state did you say again? I mean, what city, uh, what state is utilizing that now? Um, I was I was looking at um, Illinois. Um, that mm -hmm. a number of states have them. Ohio has has one, um, and it's um, generally a it's a percent of household income. Household, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. How uh, Ohio and Illinois both use um, six percent. Okay. Of their of their gross income, mm -hmm. and so there's an expectation that uh, you know customers contribute something, and then the idea would be that. Um, through the utility program, through other you know state programs, the rest of the bill um, would would be would be covered, or or as much as as could be up to perhaps if if there were a cap um, on you know the the say the rate the ratepayer surcharge or or the ratepayer impact um, from uh, from the program. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Delegate Mott has his hand up. Oh, Delegate Mott's? Oh, okay. you have to put it down before? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would note is that, as I have on the screen now, uh, the bill as it came in says that the mechanism can take the, any number of forms, whether it be a program, tariff, provision, credit, rate, rider, or other means. So that's essentially anything the utility wants to come forward with. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was by amendment at, at not, not purely at the chair, at the commission suggestion, but uh, these criteria that were added in subsection E were all, if you will, guardrails uh, and guidance for the commission um, in order to provide at least some guidance. But uh, there was some hesitation to put more specific provisions in because the mechanisms were so could be any number of so many broad categories. That's that's just from the. The drafter's perspective. That's all. Uh, I'm not not making a policy statement. Okay. Um, okay. I, Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I was just going to say. I think we we would certainly agree that having the criteria is better than not having any criteria. Um, it, it it's just um, there there is uh, you know going to be the utility proposals and then proceedings and you know this is an area where we think perhaps more more specific guidance as to um, what should be spent uh, might be helpful and might reduce um, sort of the uncertainty as to what the outcome is from that process. Guys I think we may be getting dangerously close to um, what's that saying about trying to make the, the perfect the enemy of the good or the good the enemy of the, whatever it is. I, we, we're getting real deep into this um, and we, we may be getting counterproductive at some point. You also have a bill hearing starting at 1.30. Yeah, well, we, and we certainly support, <laughs> support much, you know, much of what's in here, if not all of it. I'm, I'm not, um, I don't want to be, we don't want to be the enemy of the good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I got it. the desire of the perfect be the enemy of the good. Got it. That thank you. <laughs> All right, but let's keep at it. I mean, this is uh, we did a lot to this bill. I know, which is like I said, why I wanted everybody to weigh in and look at it, and and we'll take our time. I'm not going to ask anybody to, to vote before we're ready to go. Uh, uh, Delegate Howard, if I can, Mr. Chairman, um, if. Could, because we will be addressing your issue at some point, uh, your, your motion, when, when we get the amendment. If there's any information that, that you can provide the subcommittee as to why that's necessary, that would be helpful 
um, as well, because uh, the, the points that were being made by Delegate Walker, Delegate Charcutian, um, you know, those are legitimate questions, legitimate points. So anything that with that that you could add or, or gift us why why we shouldn't do it, I think that would be helpful, um, you know, to the membership. Okay, great. And uh, that, that amendment, you will have that, uh, Bob, I think you should have that here within an hour. Okay, uh, actually, I, I've already received something similar from another member. Excellent. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You should have it directly from my office here shortly. Okay. All righty then. Is, is... Uh, uh, Ms. Graziano from DHS has a question. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Graziano. I do, thank you. Um, just to ask before we wrap up here, I was wondering if council would be willing to share the amendments with DHS so we can spend a little more time with them. Uh, one of the things I keep returning to is my mind is probably the need to look at this in the greater landscape of all things OHEP that are moving to session given the Relief Act that was signed into mm -hmm. Day, um, the 22 million that was given to us for additional TDAP funding, which also falls under the same administration. Mm -hmm. um, and so, really, I think the department needs to look at all the resources that is going to take to move all this money, and certainly this goes into that. So, if council could share those with us, that would be wonderful. Yep. Okay. Alrighty. Any other questions or comments before? Uh, Lisa Smith is raising her hand physically. Okay, okay Lisa, <laughs> go right ahead. Okay, I didn't say yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you yeah. to both of the chairs. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Chairman Davis and uh, Chair Brooks and the committee for considering some of the issues the PSC identified in our testimony. Um, we really appreciate the fact that you've made some of these adjustments to balance um, more guidance for us with the discretion um, that remains. Um, we hear what OPC is saying that we're still working within, you know, what the utility application will be, um, but we're committed to, you know, using all of all of these additional improvements that we think are great. Um, one concern, I just wanted to piggyback on what Lauren just said, Ms. Graziano just stated, um, and, and to be honest, PSC and OHEP and DHS haven't really had time to go through this. Um, all of these issues, we know that the Relief Act amended, uh, switched out OHEP for PSD. I think that happened on Thursday, we all became aware and it became law already. Um, <laughs> you know, we only had a day or two. So we're all processing that. And I would say that sounds like getting those 83 million out the door. And, and thank you, Bill Freeman. I know you've offered assistance as well. I think getting that out the door by June 30th is going to be um, like a short term solution. And, um, you know, Chairman Davis, I know we've discussed with you um, your intent to have long term solutions, short term solutions. So one of the things I was hoping we could talk about more is even though this is an emergency bill, is there a way to maybe add in a date, give us a little more time to get all that money out the door? I don't want to put a date out there or an amendment right now. because, Like I said, I'm not sure what DHS thinks about this and how it impacts them. But maybe could we push it out a few months, give us a little time before these applications start coming in. I think that would help us because we, we are going to be all hands on deck. We're already starting to think about, you know, the Relief Act, even though the budget hasn't passed with the final language, we're, you know, really what mapping you, out. What, what would you suggest, though, Lisa? I mean, I get not wanting, and, and we got a little bit of time, but uh, we're going to need something because we... Okay, I'll you, throw out if we could add in a date for applications to come in, maybe after October one, something like that. I mean, I really defer to you, what, like your intent, and also, but I, I, I also don't want to. I don't know where DHS is with this, and if if this section impacts them at we, all. But why don't we out. have a conversation and try to figure that out? I mean, I don't want to push it out any further than it needs to be, but by the same token, I don't want to have it any sooner if if we can't handle it, and then you know we have like an unemployment situation. Um, where, where folks are expecting help and we're not delivering and that kind of thing. So maybe that's a question that we, we need to get together with them and find out what's realistic, what's doable. I mean, that, that okay. can still become a, effective or whatever overall, you know, as mm -hmm. just, but maybe that component or, or whatever we can, um, you know, we can massage that some. I think that I think that's right. It's really just our section, so maybe it doesn't have to affect the OHEP sections and the other section. I don't want to speak for them, um, right. but I think it sounds like we're already going to have to adjust. We're kind of gaming out what we'll need to do to get the other money out because we're going to need data from utilities and 
OHEP. And so it's going to be, we're already going to have to adjust our current kind of commission calendar to get that done by June 30th. So I would say until July 1st, we're going to be pretty tied up in that. Um, so, but yeah, I'm, so we're open to having that discussion with you and, and see what's doable. But I, I think it's going to be hard if these cross and now we're having applications come in from all the utilities at the same time. Okay. I think uh, okay. Mrs. Okay. Tra Mr. Chairman, if yes, I can sir. ask one simple question of, of Lisa. Uh, and Ms. Ms. Smith, that is, if, um, if if this is a separate application for proceeding, it's not tied into the rate case timeline, can the commission actually set its own timeline for deciding these? We can set a procedural schedule, indeed. Um, we cannot, it sounds like the utility would be able to file as soon as the bill becomes effective, because I don't see any bar on that. Correct, but you would be able to, by procedural schedule, possibly to put off the actual uh, consideration and approval by the commission. Is that correct? Yes, I would say typically it's around 60 days for responses, things like that. So if this is like the relief act where it becomes law next week, um, you know, even the procedural schedule will still. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if there's something that we can do in where we don't need to do it in the statute, but it's understood that the PSC would have to take its time before it actually takes up the pile of applications, which would be at its door. That's all. We're open, we're to, open to that. Let's okay. get together and talk. We'll, Bob, Lisa, uh, we'll, we'll get together and let's see if we can work that, that little bit out. That sounds good. And it's also in the context of of course, the multi-year rate plan starting. I know um, technical staff are mm -hmm. working on PEP. So it's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts on our end, but we'll be happy yep. to discuss with you further. Okay. Okay. Bill um, hearing starts uh, in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Listen. All right, wait. Yeah, okay. I just want to thank everybody for coming on. I want to thank the chair for the bill. I want to thank all the committee members for the great questions and their input. I want to thank the other guests as well. So it's a good bill. Let's see what we can do to make it even better. So thank you. For the good of all, like, oh, uh, like, like Council said, it's, it's time to go. We'll, we'll catch up on the other side. Okay.